How many ready to dive into some of the word? Yeah. All right. Online, I hope that if you're taking in uh, uh, this, this Easter service, this Resurrection Sunday in your pajamas that you got your coffee, I got mine, I'm going, I'm ready to go, so uh, let's dive into this. And I want to welcome guests today, first-time visitors, and maybe you were invited by a friend or a family member. We're so glad that you can be here, and the, it's, it's kind of remarkable. If you look back at even last year, we're, we weren't even allowed to meet. We weren't even allowed to meet and to gather. We had to do this all online, and so I'm thankful. Uh, and the reason why we gather today and why we gather every single Sunday, but particularly on Resurrection Sunday, is we are doing something that believers have been doing for over 2,000 years. They are celebrating the resurrection that Jesus not only died, but he rose again. And can I tell you, you cannot shut down the church of Jesus Christ. Because as the world grows darker, I'm telling you, man, his light is going to shine brighter. And the Bible says this, that if we're willing to lift up the name of Jesus, he, not gimmicks, not marketing methods, that he will draw all men unto him. And so I am so thankful that today that we celebrate the empty tomb. He is not there, but he is risen. And that's incredible news for you and I. What does that mean? The powers of darkness, the death, hell, and the grave, they have been defeated, and we worship the one who has given us life. Does that get, get anybody excited? Amen. Three people, the rest of you, by the end of this, hopefully you'll be a little bit more excited. And uh, But today, as we kind of journey through, I actually, as I prepared this, this Easter message, I had something totally different prepared, and then I was just reading through, and that what I do a lot is I, I, I read a lot of scripture, and I was just reading through the story of the crucifixion again, and something just kind of really stuck out to me that that in in a moment, and that's what we're going to unpack, and so I just kind of said, okay, God, I really feel that 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 you're pulling an audible here, and so I just want to kind of flow down that stream, and and so I took everything, and I, and I changed uh, the message up, and, and this message really is a reason to celebrate, but I, I believe it's going to help some of you in this place today that, that might feel discouraged, some of you in this place that might feel overwhelmed. The, you might be, uh, it almost feels like life is out of control. How many have felt that over the last little bit? It seems life is out of control in the things that maybe we used to be able to control, we can't control. And, and you might find yourself, there's more anxiety and there's, and there's more fear and there's more frustration and there's more uncertainty as you watch the news, as you hear the news, as you see things kind of coming at us from all different things. Do I believe this? Do I believe this? What is up with this? And what is up with that? It just seems everything is out of control. And so I titled this message, Out of Control. Pretty, pretty sharp, right? I'm pretty creative, right? And so I want to do this. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for me. I want to pray for those who are watching online as we dive into this today. That they would, This would be so much more than just kind of words, but it would actually be a truth that's going to penetrate your heart to help you in this season if you find your life a little bit out of control. So Father, on this Resurrection Sunday, we celebrate Jesus. And we ask that that resurrection power that is available to us would conquer fears, any fear that we may have. And, and, and for all of those that are here that are tuning in, that, that are here live or tuning in online, uh, that, that feel like their life is out of control, I, I, I pray that they would find your word a comfort and a blessing to them today. That God, that they would begin to understand that what happens when we live a fully surrendered life to our King, to our Savior, to your Son, Jesus, and, and that, that we would experience that peace, that assurance, and that comfort that only comes from your Son, Jesus. And we ask all of this in your wonderful name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now, look at your neighbor, look at them and say, hey, neighbor, don't bug me for the next 20 minutes. All right? And so, not a typical kind of Easter message that you would kind of feel because we're actually going to go backwards in the story a little bit and we're not going to just talk about the empty tomb and, and the, we, we could do that, but we're going to kind of camp out in Matthew 26 and what happened before the empty tomb 
tomb. And it was the night before the crucifixion that, that Jesus gathered those closest to him for the Last Supper, for the Passover meal that was to take place. That's his disciples. It was there that, that uh, he kind of exposed the one that was going to betray him. And it says, when they got up from that, he took them to the garden and they began to, he took those with him and, and, he, and he wanted to pray. He wanted to begin to pray and he told his disciples, sit here while I go and pray. And that's where we're going to kind of pick up the story as we look at what happens when life seems a little bit out of control and what we can do this Easter season, this Resurrection Sunday to help kind of curb that and we understand that we don't have to live out of control. So Matthew 26 in verse 38 to 40 says this. Then he said to them, now this is Jesus talking. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now, I know everybody in this room, you would probably be considered a good friend, right? You're solid, man, I got your back. And, and so if one of your friends came to you and said, hey man, you need to know, uh, man, I'm overwhelmed to the point of death. Can you keep watch me, with me? How many would you know, you'd be like, I got your back. Man, I got your back. I am for you. You don't have to worry about it, man. We are with you. We got your back. And so he says this, stay here and keep watch with me. So you think, this is Jesus. He's saying, guys, man, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Can you stay here and keep watch with me? And it says, going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, Father, this is Jesus. Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away from me. Translation, is there any other way? Do I have to go through this? Is there any other alternative that we can try to see redemption come to humanity? Is there any other way that we can kind of bring a sacrifice that is not going to have to cause me to go through what I'm going to go through? If it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. So then, eh, he returns in verse 40. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them on their knees praying. No, it didn't say that. It says he found them sleeping. He found them sleeping. And now what's interesting to me, what I find so interesting is Jesus, he could do a lot of things. He could raise the dead. He could walk on water. He could heal the sick. He could calm the storm. But he couldn't control his disciples. He asked them to do one thing. Hey, stay awake and keep watch with me. Yeah, no problem. We got your back. We got your back. And, and there he goes back and they are sleeping. Now in their defense, if you begin to study in, in the Passover meal and what takes place in that Passover meal, they actually drink four cups of wine in the Passover meal. There's four different cups of wine that you drink. So you think in, in about an evening having four cups of wine, I can tell you if I had two sips of wine, I'm done. I'm done. I, I, don't, I don't drink a lot of alcohol. And it, 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 that's a whole lot of hard thing. But here we go. They, so in their defense, that might have been, they might have been feeling sleepy. And now some of you have may have, have done this. Now be honest. You're in church. Be honest. How many of you have set out to pray? You said, man, this is going to be an amazing prayer time. You set out to pray and you start praying and all of a sudden you fall asleep. Right? It's, it's happened to a lot of us. We fall asleep, but here you go. And so they fall asleep. So a hard time that maybe we can kind of give some grace to the disciples here. But the reality is for so many of us, we actually like to be in control. There's some of you here, and you know who you are, you're a control freak, right? It's okay, receive it. My wife just put up both hands, 100%. I saw that right at the back. And, and so you, there's control freaks. We like to be in control of everything. I'm one of those guys, I'm like, eh, I just kind of roll with it, I can flow with it. I don't have to be in control of everything. But, but there's some people, you're a control freak, and look at your neighbor and do this, right? Not me, definitely. And you, those are your control freaks. You know what you would say? I'm, I'm, I'm not controlling. I'm, I'm just aggressively helpful. I'm just aggressively helpful. Or you might even say, no, no, I'm not, I'm not a control freak. I'm just thoroughly organized. I know everything. I know everything that has to take place. And now, when we look at the time and day and age that we're living in, for anybody who is a control freak, we understand that this is a frustrating season because it seems everything is out of control. 
If we're being honest, COVID has changed everything. It's changed how we work. It's changed how we travel. It's changed every, how we go to the stores, when we're allowed to go to the stores, what stores we're allowed to go to. It's brought frustration. It's brought fear. It's brought anxiety, anxiety of not knowing, fear of not knowing what am I allowed to do, what I'm not allowed to do. And, and I want to argue there is this real sense of grieving. There's a real sense of grieving in a couple of different ways, not just grieving people that are sick and we do that, we grieve, not just grieving people that have lost their jobs, there's that grieving, not just people who have lost loved ones, there's that grieving, but I would even say that there's an actual grieving of a loss of control. People are like, I don't know what to do. I'm used to being able to do what I, I want to do and now I don't even know what I'm, what I'm allowed to do and if you look at the list, what we were allowed to do maybe two years ago, we can't do it today. You can't go to a movie. You can't go to a movie theater. My, my son, who's going to be graduating high school this year, there's no prom for him. He can't go to his prom. He can't celebrate the, the, the four years that he's been in high school. He can't celebrate that. Their weddings are capped. You can't go to sporting events. You can't go watch sporting events. Getaways, you can't travel. Uh, you can't have dinner with your friends. That, that it's funny that, that now dinner with your friends, you just got to kind of almost like sneak around. And you're like, is anybody going to see what we're doing? Getting your nails done or getting your hair cut. But the good news for everybody, there's still lots of toilet paper. There's still lots of toilet paper available because we saw what happened the first time, right? People just went crazy. So technically, we're not just grieving the loss of control, but as one researcher put it, because a lot of us think we have control over things we don't have control, we're losing the illusion of control. And there's this cognitive, cognitive bias that leads us to believe that we actually have control over an outcome when in reality, we don't. When in reality, we don't, and we see a whole lot of that happening. We overestimate the degree of control we have over uncontrollable events. And here's what happens. And it's happening to a lot of you, especially if you struggle with c control, is the more we try to control, the more we're afraid of losing control. And the more we're afraid of losing control, the more we try to control. It's this vicious cycle that leads us nowhere. And I, I want to point to some pretty powerful words in Scripture in this story that we're unpacking this morning about when it comes to a life out of control and how we can begin to bring some peace, some balance, and, and, and some stability. And the most powerful words of surrender are this, and we find it in Matthew 26. And here we go. So Jesus comes back to his disciples, and they're sleeping. And he says, he went away, Jesus went away a second time in verse 42. My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. May your will be done. The most incredible, powerful words. Hey, I'm open to another way for this to happen. I'm open for another way for this to go down. But if there is no other way, may your will be done. The most incredible words to bring peace to your life. God, may your will be done. Because here's what I know. You don't always have the power to control. You don't. And you're realizing that. Because there's some things that are out of your control. But you always have the power to surrender. You always have the power to surrender. And all my control freaks said, no! What are you talking about? I don't want to give up control. What do you mean? Surrender. Because we look at things like this, what's going on in our world, or maybe the, the storm and the, what you're going through and the chaos in your life, and we look and, and we think, where is God? Where is God when life doesn't go like we want it to go? This whole COVID thing is, is did God cause it? Did, did God allow it? Is God using it? Where is God when life is hard? That is the number one question that I probably get asked a lot, especially in this season, as we're seeing this unfold, as life is out of control. Where is God when life is hard? So I began to do a little bit digging in and researchers now they're beginning to study um, 
a younger generation's belief. Those are 30 and under. How many of you here are 30 and under? Anybody in here? All right. Yeah, you can clap for yourself. You're okay. We love you. We appreciate you. So researchers, researchers are actually studying this. Some of you, how many feel like you're 30 or under, right? Yeah. <laughs> So the default religion now that is gaining steam for, for this younger generation is called MTD. It's moralistic therapeutic deism. That, this is actually a religion that is being formed. And it, it means this. It's kind of a big word. Moralistic, it means this. It equates religion with to being good, uh, moral, and nice. And, and therapeutic is faith is a means to improve your life. And deism is, well, God is real, God is real, but, but not involved in your life unless you really need him. So at the heart of this MTD, what a younger generation is buying into and is believing is this. It, a mostly uninvolved God exists to make my life better. The sole purpose God exists is to make my life better. And that's what young people are believing Left, right, and center. And who wouldn't want to believe that, right? Yeah, I'm all for that. Man, that the sole purpose that God exists is to make my life better. How many be like, sign me up? Right? Well, I want that. See, my faith in God should, should help me have a happy, help me have a healthy, comfortable, and this is it, a trouble-free life. I should have a trouble-free life. And see, the problem that we run into, if God wants me happy, then if I'm not happy, God has failed me. God has let me down. God is not real. There's nothing to this. And there's definitely not something wrong with me because uh, I'm perfect and, and, and I'm awesome. So obviously God has let me down. And I see people, you know what, I've tried I've tried prayer, I've tried religion, I've tried church, and it didn't work. I tried, and this is, I tried following Jesus, and you know what? It was hard. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's gonna be easy. Nowhere in the Bible do we have the assurance where it says, well, you know what, when you come to Jesus, well, you know what, you get a bank account that never runs out. You get to drive whatever car you wanna drive, and in whatever road you drive on, there is no traffic ever because I will part all the traffic for you and you don't have to worry about it. And a lot of us, they think that when we come to Jesus or, or at the moment in, the, in a place in our life when we begin to follow God and it gets hard, we're thinking, what, what is up with this? This is not right. Actually, Jesus said, man, this is a hard road. This is a hard road. It's why it says the road to hell is wide and, and, and it's big, but the road to life is narrow and it actually says only a few find it. So when you think about it, this, this life, Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. How many got trouble? Then rejoice, you're living life. None of us are guaranteed that we're going to live a trouble-free life. But the beautiful thing with Christ is, oh my goodness, it's amazing. Then you have these people, well, if I surrender to God, What's that gonna do for my life? If, if, like, what is the trade-off for me? Like, okay, Jesus, what are you going to give me if I choose to surrender to you? Are you gonna make me stay single for the rest of my life? Because I didn't sign up for that. I, I, I did not sign up for that. Uh, are, are you gonna heal my sickness? Are you gonna provide for me? Are you gonna answer every single one of our prayers? What is in this for me? Are you gonna make my marriage better? Are you gonna make my kids better? Are you gonna do all of these things? So if I surrender to God's will, what's going to happen? We look at what's going on in the world. How long are the lockdowns gonna last? God, what's going on with this? Are they gonna be May? Is it gonna be summer? Is the economy gonna slip into a recession? Am I gonna lose my business? And we have all these people that say, well, I follow Jesus. I pray God's will, but life is still hard. Life is still hard. It's, and I'll tell you this, as a believer, and I, I can speak firsthand, because I, I, I don't, I'm not somebody who, I had somebody last week when, when, when I was speaking, actually it was on a, this past Thursday, they said, well, your life is perfect because you're a pastor. And I just said, whoa, whoa, hold on a second here. I said, you know nothing about my life. I said, you know nothing about my life. And how can you say that my life is easy? I don't even know who my real father is. I said, do you have a father? He's like, well, yeah, I do. I said, I don't know who my real father is. 
I said, do you still have a mom? Well, yeah. I said, my mom died of cancer. I said, so how are you saying my life is easy? I, I, I have a son at the age of 16 who was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. So how is my life easy? Can you tell me that? Kind of put him in and he's like, oh, sorry. But you know what? I don't live like my life is hard. I don't walk around saying, woe is me. I walk around saying, you know what? My life is hard and it's been difficult at times, but you know what? God is faithful. God is good and I trust him. And it doesn't matter what I go through that I can stand. And people say, how can you do that? Because God is faithful. Because he's been true to his word every single time. And just because I go through a difficult season doesn't mean God has abandoned me. But it is an amazing opportunity that I understand this, that God is constantly working all things together for the good of those who love him and who were called by his name. So when I go through something, you know what I do? God, you're going to bring some good out of this. You are going to bring some good out of this. See, God's will is rarely easy, but it's always good. It's always good. It will always be good. It's rarely ever easy, but it's always Good. It may not feel like it in the moment when you're going through it, but God is, like I said, working together in all things. You look at Jesus. You look at all the people throughout Scripture. It was never easy for them. You look at, even we look at uh, Mary, Jesus' mom, and the angel visits her and says, hey, greetings, you are favored, woman of God. You are high, blessed and highly favored, and this is what's gonna happen. You think, wow, this is amazing. I'm a 16-year-old. I'm gonna carry the Messiah, and this is gonna change everything. It wasn't easy for that because she actually had to watch her son die. She actually had to watch her son be brutally beaten and crucified, that she invested 33 years in as a mom and raised him and trained him. She had to watch him die. And we think, well, hey, it wasn't easy for Jesus. We think, oh, man, what a great guy. He actually knew that this is going to be hard. And if there was any other way, but he said, not your will, mine be done. And he was beaten. He was arrested. He was whipped. Almost unconscious, they drove spikes into his wrists, into his feet. And, the, and then he hung there naked. Now, here's the beautiful thing. At any time, he could have took control. At any time that he could have took control and said, that's it, I'm done. Call forth the angels, bring them all down, bring the rain. But he didn't. He lived a surrendered life. Not my will, but yours be done. You don't always have the ability to control, but you always have the ability to surrender. And as Jesus died for our sins in that one moment and God raised him from the dead and he just didn't raise him for the elect. He just didn't raise him for a certain class of people. He raised him for everybody. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost, the hurting, the broken, the sinners, the ones that are furthest from God. That's who Jesus came from for. And a lot of us think, well, I can only come to church if I do the right thing or if I I, I say the right words. No, no, no. We need to understand that Christ paid the ultimate penalty for sin so everybody that we can all become the righteousness of God so yeah he didn't call to come just the righteous he came to call sinners but what we need to understand is God's will is not always easy but it's always good you don't always have the power to control but you always do have the power to surrender so it would lead us to a question I would love to ask you I said all that to say this Lead us to a question I would love to ask you this Resurrection Sunday. What are you trying to control that maybe you need to surrender? What are you trying to control in your life that maybe you need to surrender? Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your health. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your kids. I don't know. But we've all got those areas that I believe that that God is putting his finger on. What are you trying to control that you need to surrender? Because I'll tell you this, when it comes to our faith, when it comes to saying yes to Jesus, there's no such thing as a partial surrender. And sadly, that's where a lot of the church lives, a partial surrender. Can you imagine if Jesus said, well, you know what, this whole kind of sacrifice thing, me becoming the ultimate sacrifice, I'm cool with about 87% of it. 
The other 13%, I'm not going to do that 13%. He lived a fully surrendered life. And as a believer, we don't have an option. It's not about living a partial surrender. If you read all throughout Scripture, and it says, these serve me with their whole heart. All the way throughout all history, you see that God constantly saying, they love me, they honor me, and they serve me with their whole heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And in all your ways, acknowledge him. So it is about a fully surrendered life. And if we're being honest, maybe it's not for you, maybe it's for your neighbor, right? Because you're perfect. Online, we know it's for somebody else watching online. We trust God with some things, but do we really trust him with all things? Do we really, truly trust him with all things? God, I trust you to save me. I do, I trust you to save me, but I, I, I don't really trust you with, with my kids or, or this God. I trust, man, that, that I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get to heaven. I trust that uh, my job, I, I, I can trust for my health, I can trust for my loved ones, but I can't trust with everything. And a lot of us, that's where we live our life. Partial surrender. And we wonder why we're frustrated. We wonder why we get discouraged. We wonder why we have a hard time where we constantly feel like we're spinning our wheels because it is about living a fully surrendered life. Jesus actually died on the cross so you can live a fully surrendered life. That's what he did. He paid the price so you can be in a full relationship with God. Not just a partway relationship, but a full relationship with God. And what did it for me as I was kind of rereading this story was these two words, if and yet, if and yet. And I believe that is the key to this prayer that Jesus prays in the garden. And he says, my father, if, we all like that, if, if it's possible, may this cup be taken away from me, yet, not as I will, but as you will. And I would be so bold to say to you this morning, and maybe you're just kind of exploring this whole idea of church and faith, and maybe you were invited to church and, and you've kind of come out because, well, it's the right thing to do. It's, it's Easter, so you go to church, right? If I don't go to church, am I a bad person? I would say, if you hear anything, that this is what I want you to hear today, that real faith, absolute real faith, starts between if and yet. That's where it starts, because we're all going to have those conversations. We're all going to have that. You know what, God? If, man, if I get married or if you heal me or if I get the job with benefits or if I get into the school that you want me to get, that I want to get into, if you do all of those things, and the reality is that's where a lot of us camp out. If God does this, then I'm good. Then I'm good that we forget about the yet. And the sad thing Everything in culture, everything in our world today invites us, begs us, lures us into live a way that is contrary to the gospel. 100% contrary to the gospel. Culture tells us you take control of your life. You be in charge. You become the self-made man or the self-made woman. But Jesus says, yet not my will, but your will. If He's praying, he's believing, if, hey, if it's possible, yet. And a lot of us don't like to play the, pray the yet. A lot of us don't like to get to that place of yet. See, I want this, but even if it doesn't happen, I know your will and your plan for my life is perfect. Jesus actually said this. If we rewind a little bit further in the story, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39, he said this, if you cling to your life, you're gonna lose it. You're gonna lose it. But if you give up your life, if you surrender your life for me, you will find it. See, everything in the kingdom works opposite. You give, you get. You surrender, 
you get life. You don't surrender, you actually lose life. You miss out on the fullness that, that God has for you. And so what does it mean? Because a lot of people say, what, do, what, what does it mean to follow Jesus? It means that you're surrendering control of your life. That you're saying, God, your plan for my life is way better is way better than anything I can do, so I am going to surrender my life. And we do what we can, right? We do what we can, and we surrender what we can't. And we surrender what we can't. And here's what a lot of us, I think, don't understand in the church today, that surrender is not a one-time event. It's a daily thing. It's something that we need to do daily that we need to surrender daily because today is gonna to bring a day with all its new challenges, all these new problems we might face and are we, will we surrendered yesterday, are we willing to surrender today? Because I'll tell you this, God can do way more with your surrender than you can ever do with your control. He can do way more with your surrender than you can ever do with your control because you know what you do when you wanna control your life? God says, have at her. See you in about a week. Right? When we try to do it on our own, how many know it doesn't really work out the best? It doesn't. We could try to fill our life with all of these things that we think are going to bring us peace, that we think are, are, are going to fulfill our life, that we think that I'm willing to give God, like I'm even willing to give him 90%, but I'm holding on to that 10. And we don't live a fully surrendered life. And the reality for so many of us is we miss it by 18 inches because that's how far it is from your head to your heart. And a lot of us, we have the head knowledge of who God is, of, of the things that we need to do, but it's never become rooted and grounded in our heart. And when push comes to shove, we think we're better doing it on our own. And Jesus said, if, like all of us have prayed, Oh God, this would be great if you'd only do this. God, if you'd only heal my boy of diabetes, then that would be amazing. God, if you would only provide a job that has, is stable and it's got benefits, God, that would be incredible. God, if you only, if you only, man, kind of bring somebody into my life that I can spend the rest of my life with, that would be amazing. Yet, even if you don't, let your will be done. Because I know this, even though I want all of these things, your plan is way better. And help me never lose focus. Jesus lived a fully surrendered life, even though at any time he could have taken full control of the situation. Read it in the scripture, it says at any time he could have called down legions of angels to fight for him, to defend him, and to say enough is enough. So on this Resurrection Sunday, what are you trying to control that maybe you need to surrender? Because you don't have the power to control, but you do have the opportunity to surrender. Why don't you stand with me? I want to pray. I'm gonna ask you to bow your heads and, and we're gonna pray. So Father, right now, as we celebrate the most amazing Sunday ever, Resurrection Sunday, God, I'm asking that you would invade our hearts right here, live in our homes, those who are watching online. You would invade our hearts with a peace that goes beyond our human ability to understand. And before I continue praying, let me just say, I know there's, those of you who might say, you know what, I'm grieving. I'm grieving loss of control. I'm trying to be in control, and it might be in your relationships. It might be in your health. It might be in your finances. It might be in your job. I don't know, but wherever it is today, whatever you're trying to control, I believe God's words to you today are, let it go. Surrender it. And I'm going to ask you, I'm going to invite you to do something. I don't usually do this. But I'm going to invite you to do something as a, as a moment of surrender. 
If you want to, you don't have to. But you would look at your life and say, you know what? My life hasn't been fully surrendered. I'm gonna ask you, and the universal sign of surrender is what? Hands up. Hands up. God, I surrender. This morning, I surrender. You see, if you wanna take a, a moment of surrender, and don't worry about on the person on your left and your right, but you say, this morning, I wanna surrender. And God, my hands are going up because I can't do it on my own. I can't do it on my own. God, we acknowledge right now, we know this, that life can be difficult. It could be hard. It could be frustrating. It could be discouraging. But God, we understand this and we thank you that in this, that you are constantly working all things together for our good. God, I pray right now in this season that you would bring about the good for those who are called, for those who love you and called according to your purposes. God, we, we surrender today. God, forgive us for, for not going all out a full surrender. And we understand this, that we have a, a risen Savior because he fully surrendered to you, to your plans and your purposes. So God, forgive us for living a partial surrendered life to you. And we make the choice and we say we're all in. I'm all in for you, Jesus, because you were all in for me. You went all the way you paid the ultimate price so I could be free. So my life is not my own. I lay it down and I surrender. I know I don't have the power to control, but I do have the power to surrender. And today I surrender to you. I'll tell you what, we're all gonna pray this prayer. And this is a prayer of surrender. It's a prayer of acknowledging how much we need Jesus. And maybe you've never done it before. But I'm going to lead you in it. And let's say this, say, Jesus, I want your grace. I need your mercy. I need your forgiveness. So Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Change me. Lord, would you be my savior? Would you lead my life? Fill me with your spirit so I can know you, so I can love you, so I can walk in your truth. Today I make the choice to surrender my life completely to you. In your wonderful name I pray, amen. Well, bless you guys. Thank you for taking time to join us this Resurrection Sunday. I pray you go now and live and walk in the freedom that you have because of a risen God. Bless you guys. We'll see you next week as we kind of gather for church again. Have yourself an incredible week, and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now.